PhD from Presidency University. Then she did her MSc from IIT Bombay. Currently, she is doing his PhD from Ohio State University. The title of the today's talk is The Mystery of Corona. I am requesting everyone, please mute your microphone and turn off your video. If you have any question, please raise your hand or write down in the chat box. After finishing the talk, we will start our question answer session. Uh, over to Shangshkriti ji. Yeah. Thank you, Shushanteka. Um, I know it's not the right time to say good afternoon, but um, you know, as they say, people who leave us live through us. So today's talk is dedicated to Priyankal. I I didn't know him, but um, that doesn't really matter at this point. And. Uh, Currently, I just hope and hope that you and your family are staying well. We we are actually going through an emergency, even though officially it's not announced. So please get stay and sane. So let's start. Um, and before I start, I just want to do a brief questionnaire. I'm pasting the link of the poll here in the chat. So please go through it and um, give your answer. I'll check the result at the end of the talk. Um, so I am a fourth year graduate student at the Department of Astronomy in the Ohio State University. For last four years, I've been working on the galactic corona. And today I'm just going to give a very brief review of the field a very incomplete review, of course, um, in the context of my research. So let me share my screen. Um, post disabled participant screen sharing. Can you allow me to share it? Yeah, I think it's it's now there. It should be there. Does it does it work now? Yeah. Yep, it works. Thanks. Mm. Oops. Let me know if you see the presenter's view or the which one do you see presenter's view or the actual one i think it's fine you can go ahead uh um, if you want okay. you can you can switch off your video and that's fine but yeah now yeah. it's not full screen but i think it's fine okay no i think you are seeing the wrong view let me just try to share it again now you're seeing it full screen uh yeah i think it's fine mm, okay S sorry uh, i'm not sure why it is not sharing the correct one mm. i think this should be fine yeah it's fine anyway. okay let's go yeah it's so, fine um so I'd like to start with a questionnaire. I have already pasted the link in the chat, so you can just go ahead and um, tell your comments about what you mean by a galaxy. Because defining a galaxy is very important when you're going to define a galactic corona. And I'll check the results later, so you can um, vote anytime as we go along. So what do you mean by a galactic corona? If we start from the largest structure from a cosmological point of view, let's start with galaxy clusters, which are the largest structures. And we expect them to form at the nodes of filaments, as you can see in cosmological zoom-in simulations. One of them is shown here from the Eagle project. 
And if you start thinking of self-similar structures at smaller mass and length scale, what you'd see is galaxy clusters, galaxy groups, and individual galaxies. And same as galaxy clusters, you'd also expect the groups and galaxies to be filled with hot, dense, and bright plasma, which should be called intracluster, intragroup, and intragalactic medium, respectively. However, unlike intracluster medium, which is one of the most well-observed and well-characterized um, objects in the, in the field of astronomy, intragalactic medium, any term like that, doesn't exist. And to understand that, we now have to look at the bottom up or the galactic point of view. So here in the largest inset, you can see the mock optical face on image of a galaxy. What you are seeing is primarily the stellar light because what you see is something like this the galaxy or the stellar disk lies at the center of the gravitational potential. Stellar defines the optical bound, which is uh, usually observed with radio, defines the radio boundary. And as optical and radio astronomy are much, much older than all other electromagnetic wavelengths, we are naturally biased to define the galaxy in terms of its disk. So all the astronomical literature, or most of it, defines the galaxy as a disk, which is only a sub subset of the galactic ecosystem, I would say. Because ideally speaking, everything within the virial radius should be part of the galaxy. And from that point of view, where the disk is defined as the whole galaxy, galactic corona means, from the definition of what corona is, that a structure which surrounds the disk like a crown. And that was first predicted uh, back in 1956 by Lyman Spitzer from a very simple physical pressure equilibrium point of view. And he predicted the density and temperatures, which are in excellent agreement with today's predictions from numerical simulations. So what he predicted was just a gas in a hydrostatic equilibrium, which should, should be somewhere around million Kelvin. But at the time, he just predicted it to be above and below the disk, which is nowadays called extraplanar medium. But remember that at the time, we did not have this idea of galaxies sitting in the dark matter halos. So from that point of view, it was really groundbreaking. But now that we have this revised view of a galaxy, we know how it looks like. And um, we have redefined what galactic halo, corona, or circumgalactic medium means. Even though the name is defined from, inspired from circumstellar medium, uh, it should actually be called intragalactic from the point of view of groups or clusters. Uh, however, as I have already said, we are used to call the disk as the whole galaxy, and that's how the name has been biased. So in my whole talk, I'll use this term of CGM, galactic halo, or corona interchangeably because they all mean the same. So anything beyond the disk and within virial radius should be called the CGM. And extraplanar region, as was um, predicted by Spitzer, is just a subset of it, which is sometimes called the inner halo. Now the question is, why does it even matter? Well, the first thing is just by existing there, it solves a huge problem of baryon discontinuity because galaxy halos are viewed, viewed as spherical structures which are connected to each other by intergalactic filaments, as you can see here in the simulation, where the density is color-coded and each individual galaxies are shown here in blue dots. Now, if the galaxies are connected with each other through IGM and all the variants in a galaxy are concentrated within the disk, the question would be what happens to this vast baryonic emptiness if the CGM doesn't exist. So just to explain the continuous flow of baryons from IGM to ISM, you need something in between. However, apart from that, it also helps us to solve a lot of problems which I'm going to discuss next. 
So one of the things is the baryon fraction, that is the ratio of baryon to total matter, which includes both uh, baryonic and dark matter. And this fraction seems to be somewhere around uh, 16% and very well precised. At high redshift, all observations are pretty much consistent with that. However, as you come to lower redshift, looks like more than one third of the baryons are actually missing. They are at least not observationally detected. So this, this leads to two di different questions. One is that, is the baryon fraction truly universal or does it evolve with redshift? Or if we come from a more pragmatic point of view, we just assume baryon fraction to be constant and then the question should be, where are these missing baryons? Can the IgM and CGM be the solutions or something else? So here I am showing a baryon budget, the most updated baryon budget of the universe today. And uh, as you can see here from pie chart, uh, WIM actually covers a significant part of it. WIM refers to one hot intergalactic medium, and this term one hot itself is kind of a sandwich because it means a range which is cooler than hot and hotter than warm. And at some point, people ran out of ran out of words and just called it warm hot. So the intergalactic medium uh, right now is just a prediction. And since hydrogen and helium are mostly ionized at this temperature, it is extremely challenging to detect at low redshift. Unlike the higher redshift where you can nicely predict it with the Lyman alpha forest, you have to uh, trace the intergalactic medium at lower redshift using metals. And that leads to a lot of uncertainty using ionization and metallicity correction. So right now, the mass estimate of WIM is uncertain by more than an order of magnitude, which is huge even in terms of astronomy. So the whole thing is right now very uncertain. What they're showing here in the pie chart in the inner, inner circle is the upper limit, which kind of gives you a hint that they might account for all the missing variants. But if you look at the best fit, which is shown here in the outer pie chart, you can see that a lot of spaces are left blank, shown in white. And that shows you that we haven't still been able to account for all the missing variants. And the question is if CGM can account for that. Now, if we look at from a more galactic point of view, it comes to a subset of the missing variants or the missing galactic variants problem. So here I'm showing the baryon fraction is a function of stellar mass and red and blue respectively shows the baryons in the stars and the interstellar gas. And if you compare it with the dashed line, which is the limit for baryon sufficiency, you can see that a large fraction of the baryons are missing from the Ds. So what we actually call as a galaxy, which is the Ds, harbors for a very small fraction of the baryons. And it leads to two questions. One is that, can CGM actually account for all the baryons? Or if not, why are the galaxies not baryon sufficient like their massive counterparts? So uh, searching for the baryons in the CGM is one of the very most important questions right now in astronomy. The next one is missing metals problem, which is very much related to missing galactic baryons because you have to trace these baryons using metals anyway. Now we know that uh, all metals are produced by stars and they dump it to the interstellar medium once they die. But the galactic discs contain only 20% of the metals ever produced. Here in the plot, as you can see, shown in red, blue, and orange, uh, these are the galactic contribution of metals across the stellar mass, and they are at most 20%. So again, the natural question would be how much of the metals are in the CGM. And uh, by looking at the lower ionization states, it looks like some of the metals can indeed be there, especially for low mass galaxies. But yet 40 to 60% of the metals are unaccounted. And the question is whether it is in the much hotter phase traced by X-ray. So to search for missing, galax missing galactic variants and metals, it is important to study CGM. And here is the quintessential picture of CGM as you have probably seen in other CGM talks as well. So CGM is the space between ISM and IGM. So all kinds of gas flows, the accretion of gas from the IGM, the outflows coming from the disk and the recycling, everything happens in CGM. And these gas flows are the galactic evolution. 
So if you're interested in anything related to the disc at some point, you should look at cesium properties to understand how they are co-evolving and regulating each other. And as was nicely put by the, re the review paper that it is the fuel tank, waste dump and recycling hub of a galaxy all at the same time. Right now, our observational view is nowhere close to what you are seeing here in the artist's illustration. So that's, that's going to be the project for future. And here is, I'd say, a brief um, ABC of the qualitative theory of what CGM is. And most of the theories qualitatively agree with each other at a point that for a Milky Way like galaxies, you'd expect the gas to be shock heated as it enters the halo from the IGM and it fills up the whole volume. But within that, some fraction of it will start cooling due to thermal and hydrodynamic instability and start forming clouds and clumps. And depending on what your cooling time scale and free fall time scale is, some of it might fall back to the disk or just hang out there in the halo. And uh, the phase structure is kind of predicted to be hierarchical in the sense that the most dense and cold structures are surrounded by mildly ionized and cooled structures. And at the interface of the hot and cool, there is again a thin, thin, moderately ionized warm phase. So as you go from inside to outside, you are going from low density to high density, sorry, high to low density and smaller temperature to higher temperature. So qualitatively speaking, this is what the phase structure looks like. And this primarily comes from a pressure equilibrium scenario. If you're interested more in the details, you can look at this comprehensive paper, but this is more or less what the cartoon view of a CGM should look like. Okay. So right now, is there any clarifying question from the audience before I go to the second part? If not, I can just uh, move to the second part. Uh, so this is what my thesis consists of. It has three parts. One is the hot CGM of Milky Way. One is the hot CGM of other nearby Milky Way-like galaxies. And the other is neutral CGM of Milky Way-like galaxies. So in today's talk, I'm just going to concentrate on the hot CGM of Milky Way. Even though Milky Way can be observed in multiple wavelengths and it is indeed the best lab for studying the CGM. I'm going to concentrate mostly on the hot one because it accounts for the maximum amount of variance and metals. So the first observational evidence came back um, in 2000 around, which is almost 50 years after Spitzer predicted of the galactic corona. Uh, it, it came from Rosette, and here in the top right plot, I'm showing the effective area as a function of energy. What you're seeing here is different wave bands labeled here with R1, 2, 4, 5, and so on. So in Rosette, you couldn't see a spectrum. You could just measure the total photon count in each of the bands. And by combining the photon counts in two consecutive bands, that is 1, 2, Four, five and six seven you could construct the all sky maps in three different energies which are shown here in the left uh, from top to bottom these are one fourth three fourth and 1.5 kV now by assuming the emission from the plasma to be a perfect free free emission at a given temperature of a plasma you know what the slope should be and you know what the count should be in each wave band and by comparing the count ratios in each of the consecutive bands, you can estimate the temperature of the plasma or more than one temperature if it is present. And since it is an all sky, you can also study the angular distribution of this temperature component and see if it is coming from a local emission or something beyond the disk. So those are the two principles that Rosette used. And by doing so, people found not one or two, but three different temperature components. One of them, which is called local hot bubble, just because it is local, is a million Kelvin gas, which is more or less approximately seem to be isotropic. The other two, which were called trans absorption emission, which is an emission partially absorbed by our galactic disk, 
is also one of them coming from a uh, million Kelvin gas and the other one hotter by a factor of two to three, which are called soft and hard component of the transabsorption. So the basic takeaway from the rosette was this. We are, our solar neighborhood is living within a million Kelvin hot bubble, which is shown here in the yellow circle. And beyond the disk, we have two different temperature components across the sky in the halo, which differ by a factor of two to three. And this hot bubble actually solved a lot of problems in the sense that it fills up the local cavity in neutral hydrogen, which was found back in 70s and is in nicely pressure equilibrium with the cold gas. And in any soft X-ray observation, you have to remember about the hot bubble because it is the brightest component. Now with the next generation X-ray observations, where you had Chandra, Suzaku and XMM, the whole thing went up by an order of magnitude because now instead of a survey, you have a pointed observation. So you can do repeated observation as you need, or you can make it as deep as you want, depending on the science you want to do. And also instead of photon ratio, now you can actually look at the spectral energy distribution. And thirdly, in addition to emission, you can now also do absorption and combine them to get more better handle on the physical characteristics. So next I'm going to discuss three different experimental techniques in brief. Uh, one of them is the shadow experiment where you choose to close by sight lines shown here. One of them is a blank sky, which means you can measure everything coming from the galactic halo. The other one is toward a molecular cloud a little above or below the plane. And uh, it is so dense that it can absorb all the emission beyond it, which means you can only measure the foreground emission from this. And by comparing the emissions along these two sight lines, you can estimate what is truly coming from the outer halo beyond the distance of this cloud. The next one is blank sky and QSO observation, where you combine the emission and absorption. So here you look for the absorption features of metals in the galactic halo at redshift zero, looking toward a quasar sight line. And also you search for blank sky and estimate the emission um, along the directions pretty close to the absorption sight line. And you can combine them. The next one is a quasar XRB observation, which is, I would say, the absorption version of the shadow experiment. Here, same as previous, you measure the metal absorptions here toward the quasar, but you also find some of the extra binaries which are close to the galactic plane and search for the metal absorption and compare them to estimate what excess absorption is coming from toward this uh, extra galactic sight line. So that tells you the absorption coming truly from beyond the XRBs and coming actually from the outer halos. So this is one of the snippets of shadow experiments. Here in the top left, I'm showing an infrared view of what people do in shadows. And um, this is MBM20, which is a molecular cloud glowing in infrared. So here people can uh, measure the foreground emission. And this is a blank sky, which means you don't really have any known structure. And you can measure all the emission coming from the galactic halo. Now by comparing them, people find that there is a clear excess coming from the blank sky, which is shown here in the uh, empty circles. And the foreground emission is uh, shown here with the field circle. So you can clearly see in the soft X-ray, you have an excess emission. And you can do this experiment along all the sight lines you have in your sample and estimate the temperatures and surface brightness. So the main takeaway from the shadow experiments were that um, the temperature more or less is constant. It is different um, by at most a factor of two across the sky, but the surface brightness varies by almost an order of magnitude. Next, the emission and absorption combination. So here people found that uh, they could uh, distinguish between the spectral lines and the continuum since they had high signal to noise. And now they could estimate the temperature from the spectral lines specifically. 
And as I've already said, it is completely ionized and you have to trace it with metals. So here oxygen is the most abundant metal and you have to trace it with the helium-like and hydrogen-like uh, ions of oxygen. And at a given temperature, you know the relative intensities of these two ions. So by estimating their ratios, you, you, can, you can calculate what the temperature is. And similarly, you can do that exercise in absorption as well, because it doesn't matter whether you're seeing it in emission or absorption, it is the same ion. And it was again done across the sky along around 50 sight lines in absorption and more than 100 sight lines in emission. And they were in excellent agreement with the shadow experiments in the sense that one, they also seemed pretty anisotropic across the sky. They varied by orders of magnitude um, in normalization. And also the temperature seemed pretty much constant, which was somewhere around 10 to the 6.3 Kelvin. And also the temperature from emission and absorption seem to be exactly the same. And that tells you that we are actually looking at the same phase. Now, as emission and absorption depends on density differently, one is proportional to density square and the other is density, you can combine them to get the density and path length and estimate the mass. And by doing so, it was found that the Milky Way halo is extended over 100 kiloparsec, which shows that it, it, it actually covers a significant fraction of the whole volume within the virial radius. And also it is as massive as the stellar mass, which indicates that it may account for the missing baryons. So it was a pretty significant discovery. And next came the third type of experiment where you can combine the absorption from uh, XRBs and the quasars. And again, it was an excellent agreement with the previous two types of experiments. Here, the baryons, which is shown here in blue, seem to account for all the missing ones within 250 kiloparsec, which is the which is the virial radius. And it was also found to be anisotropic, varying by more than two orders of magnitude across the sky and so on. So the summary from these three different kinds of experiments using different data from different uh, uh, satellites which have different systematics, they all came together in excellent agreement and saying that it is the galactic corona is isothermal, it is extended out to a significant volume, it is massive and anisotropic. So everything fits very well together. And now comes me. And before I go um, discuss uh, the rest half of the talk, uh, I'll just ask if there is any clarifying question. Okay. Looks like there is no question. So let me now move on to the next part, the last part of the talk. So here comes the skeptic me. Is the galactic halo indeed isothermal, extended, massive, and anisotropic? Because the agreement between three different in, in independent experiments seem too good to be true. And there could be some measurement bias, which is um, making all these um, apparently agreeing with each other. And to understand that conundrum, you have to start with a basic high school algebra question of can you solve n unknowns with less than one n equations you know the answer but i'm going to now discuss it in detail as the hot halo is almost completely ionized you are tracing it with metals which is fine now you have two different tracers one is oxygen seven and oxygen eight because these are the two strongest ions you can trace now, if you take the ratios, the ratio of two numbers is always going to be one number. And you can never find any inconsistency when you just have one number in hand. And that would be more clear if you look at these, uh, these two plots here. In the top, I'm showing ion fraction as a function of temperature. And below is the emissivity as a function of temperature. Now, in the top, you can see oxygen 7 that spans a significant range of temperature and you can uh, probe everything using absorption. 
However, emissivity, which also depends in addition to what its abundance is, which also depends on its transition probability, sharply peaks at a certain temperature of 10 to the 6.3, and then it drops almost like a rock, which means the emission measurements are already going to be biased toward a certain temperature where oxygen is most likely to transit. And even if you have oxygen 7 over a large range, it is not sensitive to emission. So to search for this in inconsistency, you have to first use the absorption measurements of more than two ionization states. And since you have three ions, you can now have two different ratios and you can search for this inconsistency. So in addition to oxygen 7 and 8, you can add oxygen 6, which is the lithium-like um, electron structure of, of uh, oxygen. It has three electrons and you can observe it in UV. And by combining these three, actually back in 2005, one of the studies found that once you look for um, the temperature predicted by these ion ratios, uh, oxygen 6, which is shown here in green, predicts a much lower temperature than what you find in oxygen 7 and 8, which is shown here in red. And that clearly shows you that they do not really um, overlap with each other, even within 3 sigma. The range you are seeing here is 3 sigma. And after that, for a long time, people didn't really look at it carefully. And the main reason being these type of experiments are really expensive and it is not that easy to find high signal to noise to do this experiment for more than one sight lines. And also another problem is once you know you have two temperatures, you have to decide what fraction of oxygen six is coming from the lower versus the hotter phase. So in addition to two temperatures, now you have another uncertainty, uh, which is the fraction of oxygen distributed. And now you have three unknowns and two ratios of ions. So again, you are unlikely going to be solved. It. The way you can break the degeneracy is using multiple metals and multiple tracers of different metals. So what I'm showing here is the ionization fraction as a function of temperature for the helium-like and hydrogen-like ions of different metals. These are the two most extreme uh, ionization states of any atom you can expect. So I show the dashed line and the solid lines for helium and hydrogen like. And as you can see from carbon to silicon, as you are going from lighter to heavier elements, each of them are tracing a unique range of temperature. So if you manage to detect all these ions and estimate the temperature individually from each of these elements, for each of the element, you will have one temperature and you can compare them and see if they all overlap with each other. If they do, that's great. They are indeed coming from the same phase and you have a very good precision. However, if they're not, they, they will be a good indicator of more than one phase in the hot region. And that's what we do in, in my thesis. Now for doing that, you need a very high signal to noise, as I said, and it is not that easy to get. So we started with one sight line, which we observed for 1.86 megasecond, which translates to three weeks. And it is very, very unusual to get such high signal to noise. But our goal was to go beyond oxygen and look for at least one or two more elements to search for the inconsistency in temperature. And we were successful. We found this excellent spectrum where you can see clearly all the ions of nitrogen, neon, and oxygen. Some of these ions were already known, but for the first time, we were able to detect significantly a line, absorption line from neon 10. And just by looking at the line, you can immediately say that there is going to be more than one line, because if, if I just go back for a bit, neon 10 comes from a much hotter gas from rest of the ions you are looking at. So we had to do an ionization modeling to estimate the temperatures. Uh, we started with one phase and that didn't work, that didn't explain all the ions we are looking at and we had to go for multiple temperatures. And to our surprise, we found the second temperature to be as hot as 10 million Kelvin, 
we knew there is going to be more than one temperature, but we didn't expect to be this hot. And its column density says that it is not even a negligible phase. It, it has indeed a lot of mass in it. And additionally, we also found other, other results uh, which are not really expected in a Milky Way like Halo. So right now at this point, there is no galactic evolution model which predicts such a hot gas in the halo of a Milky Way-like galaxy. Neither does, does it predict uh, such a high alpha enhancement because in a Milky Way-like halo, you'd expect everything to be pretty much consistent with solar. So it, it remained pretty much mysterious. And to add to our distress now, we look along the emission sight lines close to it to see if we also can find this hot gas in, in emission. So in brief, the result is that, yes, we do find two different temperature components, which is shown here in blue and red, respectively. And we also estimate the temperatures. However, unlike the previous cases where I said temperature from emission and absorption fit uh, completely with each other, here they don't agree. And I'm showing the best fit value, but um, in a moment, I'm going to discuss their errors as well. But the mismatch between the temperatures itself uh, was a very uncomfortable thing for us because we really didn't expect this. And to understand what is going on now, we are bringing all the measurements from last 20 years together and find a picture something like this. So here you're seeing the temperature estimates using three different techniques, as I have discussed before, using four different uh, satellites. And what you can see is that the temperatures are spanning a pretty large range, almost more than an order of magnitude. And a lot of them are actually lining up along the virial radius, which is great because it tells you that at least at a zeroth order, the, the halo is virialized and in hydrostatic equilibrium. However, if you remember the cartoon picture, I told you about an interface between the cool and the hot phase. And that interface is basically a transition temperature, which is showing the a fraction of gas at virial temperature cooling and passing to below below million Kelvin gas. And what we have might have unexpectedly detected is actually the transition temperature in absorption, which is already known from Rosette for a long time, but was neglected in between for all these observations. However, what is more mysterious is this hotter component because it has never been seen before. And from their error bars, it is very hard to say whether they are indeed different or not. They are consistent within two sigma. So we, we th think about both possibilities of whether they are actually coming from the same phase or not. If they're coming from the same phase, it has to be a very low temperature and large path length indicating that we might have accidentally detected the local group medium. But the other possibility is that this hot phase is actually coming from a special structure close to the Fermi bubble. So here in the top left, I'm showing the Fermi bubble, which is also found in the Rosette survey, where you can see some of the dense bright structures surrounding the Fermi bubble, which I also show here in a zoomed in view. And our sight line actually passes through some of these dense bright structures. So we couldn't rule out the possibility that the emission is actually coming from these and not some random structure of the CGM. And after one year, now that Erosita bubble has been discovered and we can see that it is, our sight line is clearly going through that and uh, the geometry and density of Erosita bubble is perfectly consistent with our emission measure. Now we are more sure that this temperature is indeed different from the hotter one, but now the hot one still remains a mystery because the Erosita bubble cannot explain all the absorption we are seeing through. So the next immediate thing you can imagine is just building up the sample of this high signal to noise spectrum to search for similar, uh, similarly hot gas. And that's what I've been doing now. So this is, a work in progress, we, we plan to submit it next week, hopefully. So we are doing the same thing as before. The only difference is that now we are just increasing the number of metals to get a better handle of the whole phase structure. 
and also since it is a very high signal to noise in fact uh, the highest signal to noise ever achieved in x ray absorption which is above 100 it allows us to also search for the non thermal broadening for the first time which we couldn't do before and i'll be happy to talk about the details if there is any question from the audience but the same result is same as before we do see strong lines of neon 10 and now we also see silicon 14 which we are seeing for the first time and in the other side we can see carbon 5 which if you remember the ionization fraction comes from below million kelvin gas and silicon 14 comes from above 10 kelvin which already tells you that uh, something is going wrong it has to be more than one phase so same as before doing the ionization modeling we find this whole structure i'm not going to discuss it in detail because it itself can be a separate talk but the two main takeaways is that there are three different temperature components uh, one we call the really hot gas the other one the warm hot and the other is warm and uh, for the first time we have been able to constrain the non-thermal broadening and we also keep continue to find uh, very weird abundance structures which we can't explain and in addition yes the mysterious hot gas is again there and this time we are looking toward anti-galactic center so no erosita bubble is going to save you so right now we are talking to theories to understand what is going wrong with these five panels uh, because there is no galactic evolution model which predicts that and it has to be a combination of stellar nucleosynthesis and mixing in the CGM and the galactic feedback, uh, its treatment starting from the ICM, uh, ISM to the CGM. So it's a lot of things which are uh, still unresolved and will be part of the future plan. So this is the current status of the million, 10 million Kelvin gas. There are currently 11 site lines where we find this and we have no idea how it um, correlates with the galactic coordinates because they are very much randomly distributed over the sky. And in brief, I'll just mention that uh, the future of CGM looks very, very promising. It has been considered as one of the main science goals of upcoming extra missions. And both for uh, theorists, observers, and also instrument scientists, it, it, it is going to be the high time to observe and characterize the CGM in more detail than ever before. I'd like to stop by showing this um, uh, animation from ESA News, which covered our finding of the 10 million Kelvin hot gas. So here we're just showing the non-solar abundance ratios in different colors and in the background, the multi-temperature uh, phase is uh, shown with uh, more than one colored fuzz. So the summary of this talk in one sentence will be, we have already ruled out the simplest picture of isothermal virialized hot CGM. What it is, is, is a definitely complex ecosystem, but we don't yet know how complex it is or how it depends on galactic, prop galactic properties. So understanding that will be uh, part of the future endeavor. Having said that, I'll stop and take questions. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Samashkati ji. Uh, if anyone has any questions, please write, your, write in the chat box or raise your hand. I, uh, I have a Olumkar Dotto have a question. Uh, please uh, unmute yourself, Olumkar Dotto. Yes, uh, so if no one has any other qu any questions, so I would I like to ask this because it's a bit on the tangent of uh, what you discussed in this talk. So there has recently been this observation back in early April of this Bharatwaj and Gensler regarding the DEM measurements. So uh, uh, this work finds the DEM of an FRB which is uh, very low and uh, and localizes the host to i think uh, m81 with very high confidence so i was just wondering that uh, uh, this uh, low things are quite low in comparison to the empirical work which Xavier Prochaska does or even your work back on uh, october right 
and seems to be more in agreement with uh, some of the density modeling works like those of Yamazaki or Dolag. So what are you, I'm just curious, what are your thoughts regarding that? Yeah, right. I um, I didn't talk about dispersion measures because uh, that would make the talk more diffuse. But yes, it is. Yes. yes. Um, uh, yeah, so for the I audience wanted... who are not aware of what dispersion measure is, it is basically the column density of uh, free electrons along your line of sight. Um, so as you said, yeah, uh, I know of that paper. Uh, so I had a brief discussion with the first author of that paper. Um, what they are characterizing and what they're using for uh, the Milky Way's halo is actually not, I would say, the galactic halo indeed. So the problem in the community right now is distinguishing between um, the contribution from the ism and the halo because once you are sitting on the disk of milky way uh, it is not very straightforward to uh, understand what fraction of your uh, measurement is coming from the disk versus the halo so in their paper what they use is the most traditional values which is um, primarily you know an inflated disk model of the halo, which, which just assumes the gaseous distribution to be above and beyond the disk. It is not really, I would say, the true galactic halo. And as you said, uh, Prochaska's model, that is actually in agreement with, more or less in agreement with our findings. And that is because we are now looking at the absorptions. As you have seen in the talk, emission is proportional to density square, and that is more biased toward the denser structures, which you find closer to the disk. And what uh, Bharadwaj papers uh, cites and uses in their data is the models based on emission measurements. So they will be naturally biased toward the denser and more compact structure closer to clue. To the disk that that might explain the discrepancy in the dispersion measure they are finding does that answer your question yes yes actually i'm working on uh, having uh, just an exhaustive library of all these different uh, models of the galactic corona and what i feel in some of these works is that when uh, some of these models put too much stress on some parameters which is typical for this model and Maybe this is uh, something to, uh, because of uh, uh, there is a systematic limitation in their choice of models they have. So uh, it would be nice that I thought that to have uh, a ready to available library of all the different models here. So since you are an expert in this field, if you don't mind, then I would perhaps bother you uh, in, in future if I need any help. Yeah, sure, sure. And I'm aware of what you're working on. So. Thanks, thanks. Um, I'd just like to mention that right now, as an observer, I would recommend to not go directly for density models and better first restrict, it, restrict yourself to what the observations tell you and try to get a phenomenological model. The problem with the density models, as you can see from a physics point of view, is it always starts with a spherical cow assumption and both emission and absorption separately or together give an indication that emission or absorption varies by more than an order of magnitude across the sky. And you cannot explain that uh, by any correlation with the galactic coordinates. So unlike the galactic disk where you know the geometry that um, you, you expect a higher column density close to the latitude and it goes down as you're moving away. You start fitting it with an exponential. That, that all makes sense. But when you're in the halo, it, is, it, it, it can be spherical only when your measurements are within error consistent with a spherical halo. But 
an order of magnitude dispersion is way beyond what you expect in a in a you know nicely geometrically ordered uh, structure right so actually in our paper on the dm what we showed is an empirical model we did not use absolutely any right. assumption yeah. about the density structure yes yes right right so that that makes a difference yeah yeah i really like that by the way yeah the and that is easy to use i mean combining of k alpha and k beta i really like right. that method uh what is that yeah this this one so any yes, spherical yes. or cylindrical or any geometrically ordered model will find it hard to explain this whole dispersion so yeah that is that is good to write and keep remember in mind thanks thanks mm -hmm. Uh, I will see a question in the world. Uh, so I have a small question. What is Fermi bubble? I sorry, I I I can't hear you. It's getting broken. I okay. Can Is it my connection that? or no? Hello. Hello. It's it's totally getting broken. Um. Can you hear me? Yes, I think we can hear you very clearly, Shashkriti. So, but uh, yeah, I can hear your voice, Shuchitanandi. But uh, yeah, I think there was a. Yes, yeah, Shushantika okay, had a question, right? Shushantika, you had a question. Alamkar, is this the question she asked? She is asking, "What is a Fermi bubble?" Yes, I, th okay. I think I heard right. that. Right. And yeah. then Auditor okay. has a question. Yeah. Okay. So, Fermi bubble is a bubble-like structure, as you can see here in uh, top left. It's a bubble-like structure above and below the galactic plane, uh, which was found by Fermi gamma ray satellite. That's why it's called Fermi bubble. And what you are seeing here is the gamma ray image. So, the the exact reason behind the formation of Fermi bubble is still unresolved. Right now, it is it has two different um, theories. One is that uh, two, both of them sound pretty much exotic, and um, one of them is that Milky Way was a starburst galaxy a long time back, and uh, since uh, its star formation rate is uh, very high within the central molecular zone. Um, if you kind of try to extrapolate its star formation rate back in time, assuming that it was very high uh, at some time back, it, it might be consistent with a starburst galaxy. So what is theorized is that uh, this starburst galaxy had a strong wind and uh, this galactic wind kind of uh, removed everything on its way because uh, there was some CGM here. It just removed it on its way. And at some point it started decelerating. So it, it is surrounded by a structure from the galactic corona, which is denser and shock heated by the wind and which has also kind of stopped the wind at some point, uh, a couple tens of kiloparsec above and below the disk. And that has led to this bubble-like structure. And the other theory, which again, I mean, uh, theoretically it is very hard to discriminate. The other one is that there might be an Aegean, uh, which has now died in Milky Way. And uh, that could have also led to a galactic wind um so from the point of view of x-ray and gamma ray observations it is impossible to say whether it was um, an aegean wind or a starburst wind uh, and we need much lower uh, temperature observations to figure out how the cooling is happening along this boundary of the bubble to see what uh, what caused this so that's the current status, uh, qualitatively speaking. 
Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, we don't see any question. Hello? Yeah. No, I think, I think Ar Aritro says that he has a question. Okay, hmm. Aritro, do you want to ask your question? Uh, hi. So, uh, my question is uh, perhaps a simple one because I do not know much about this topic. So, how do we differentiate between a circumgalactic medium and an intergalactic medium? Is there a length scale or a temperature scale for doing so? Yeah, right. That's, that's a very nice question. Yeah, when you are sitting on the Milky Way, it can be very tricky. Uh, but uh, as you have already guessed, I mean, you have already answered in your question is that the density and path length are one of the two things uh, based on which we can discriminate between CGM and IGM. And uh, the average density you expect in a CGM is uh, somewhere around uh, five times 10 to the minus four per centimeter cube or above. And IGM is expected to be below 10 to the minus five. And that already gives you a factor of few difference in densities. And the path length is basically, you know, if it is beyond the virial radius, you don't call it a CGM anymore. So that is one of the ways to see it. The other is that, um, again, it is related to density but uh, the CGM is expected to be uh, collisionally ionized, uh, which means there is no significant contribution from photoionization. And that is because uh, the density is high enough to, to have significant amount of collisional ionization. But in the IGM, you will have enough of photoionization just because your density is going down. And you will see a different ratios of ion structures in your spectrum, which you don't see. So uh, that's that's a more, I would say, empirical way to see if you uh, if the system you are observing is truly from the IGM or the CGM. Okay. And so uh, when you mentioned about virial radius, and we also know that uh, we can define the dark matter halo of a galaxy by some virial radius. Are these two real radiuses same? Yes. Okay. So, anyone has any question? I don't see any question. So, we don't see any question anymore. Ma'am, maybe we can end the meeting. Yes, and thank you very much, Arshpiti, for waking up so early and giving this beautiful talk. Uh, My pleasure. So we'll definitely post it in, uh, in YouTube, in the students' channel, the Precision channel. And uh, thank you others also uh, who came both for the, the memorial session and, uh, talk, and the talk. Thanks a lot. And thanks to the people who organized this, Nagunita and Aritro and others. Thank you, Arshpiti. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Shantika, thank you so much. We can end the talk yeah. now. Yeah. Okay. Goodbye, everyone. Stay safe. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye, Shantika. Bye.